ചാപ്റ്റർ നയൻ കിങ്സ് ആൻഡ് ക്രോണിക്കിൾസ് സിക്സ്റ്റീൻ ടു സെവൻറ്റീൻ സെഞ്ചുറീസ് ക്രോണിക്കിൾസ് ക്രോണിക്കിൾസ് ആർ ടെക്സ്റ്റ് വിച്ച് പ്രസൻറ്റ് എ കണ്ടിന്യൂസ് ക്രോണോളജിക്കൽ റെക്കോർഡ് ഓഫ് എവൻസ് മുഗൾ റൂളേഴ്സ് ബിലീവ്ഡ് ഇൻ ഡിവൈൻ റൈറ്റ് ഓഫ് കിങ്ഷിപ്പ് ദ മുഗൾ കിങ്സ് കമ്മീഷൻഡ് കോർട്ട് ഹിസ്റ്റോറിയൻസ് ടു റൈറ്റ് അക്കൗണ്ട്സ് മോഡേൺ ഹിസ്റ്റോറിയൻസ് ഹാവ് ടേംഡ് ദിസ് ജേണ്ട ഓഫ് ടെക്സ് ആസ് ക്രോണിക്കിൾസ് ദ മുഗൾസ് ആൻഡ് ദെയർ എംപയർ ഒറിജിൻ ഓഫ് മുഗൾസ് ദ നെയിം മുഗൾ ഡിറൈവ്സ് ഫ്രം മംഗോൾ Mughals referred themselves as Timurids as descendants of the Turkish ruler Timur on the paternal side Chagatai Turks traced descent from the eldest son of Genghis Khan Babur the first Mughal ruler was related to Genghis Khan from his mother's side During the 16th century Europeans used the term mughal to describe the indian rulers even the name of mowgli the young hero of rudyard kipling's jungle book is derived from it the founder of the empire sihiruddin babur was driven from his central asian homeland fergana by the warring uzbeks babur first established himself at kabul and then in 1526 pushed further into the indian with his clan his successor nasiruddin humayun expanded the territory of his empire but lost to the afghan leader sher shah sur who drove him into exile humayun took refuge in court of the safavid ruler of iran in 1555 Humayun defeated the Sours but died a year later. Jalaluddin Akbar, the greatest of all Mughal emperors, for he not only expanded but also consolidated his empire, making it the largest, strongest and richest kingdom of his time. Akbar succeeded in extending the frontiers of the empire to the Hindu Kush mountains and checked the expansionist designs of Uzbeks of Turan in Central Asia and Safavids of Iran. Akbar had three fairly able successors in Jahangir, Shah Jahan and Aurangzeb. During the 16th and 17th centuries, the institutions of imperial structure were created. After 1707 following the death of Aurangzeb the power of dynasty diminished regional powers acquired greater autonomy in 1857 the last emperor of this dynasty Bahadur Shah II was overthrown by the british the production of why chronicles written one in order to project a vision of an enlightened kingdom two to convey to those who resisted the rule of mughals that all resistance was destined to fail three to ensure that there was an account of their rule for posterity who were the authors of chronicles courtiers content of chronicle events centered on the ruler his family the court and nobles was and administrative arrangements titles of the chronicles the akbar nama badshah nama alangir nama the story of akbar shah jahan and alangir a title alangir was a title of the mughal ruler aurangzeb language of chronicles from turkish to persian mughal court chronicles were written in persian during delhi sultanate the language of the court and literary writings were persian and hindavi 
Mughal rulers were Chagthai Turks by origin. Turkish was their mother tongue. Babur wrote poetry and his memoirs in Turkish. It was Akbar who consciously set out to make Persian the leading language of the Mughal court. Cultural and intellectual contacts with Iran motivated the emperor to adopt Persian. Persian was elevated to the language of Mughal empire. A new language, Urdu, sprang from the intersection of sprang from the interaction of Persian with Hindavi. Akbarnama were written in Persian. Babur's memoirs were translated from the Turkish into the Persian Babarnama. Translations of Sanskrit texts such as the Mahabharata and Ramayana into Persian were commissioned by the Mughal emperors. The Mahabharata was translated as Rasamnama, Book of Wars. Mughal rulers and their capitals. Babur, Agra, Humayun, Agra, Akbar, Agra, Fatepusikri, Lahore, and Agra, Jahangir, Agra, Shah Jahan, Agra, Shah Janabad, Aurangzeb, Delhi. The making of manuscripts. All books in Mughal India were manuscripts, that is, they were handwritten. The center of manuscript production was the Imperial Karkana. Kitabkhana was a scriptorium, that is, a place where the emperor's collection of manuscripts was kept and new manuscripts were produced. Paper makers were needed to prepare the folios of manuscript. Scribes or calligraphers to copy the text. Gliders to illuminate the pages. Painters to illustrate scenes from the text. Bookbinders to gather the individual folios and set them within ornamental, ornamental covers. Calligraphy, the art of handwriting, was considered a skill of great importance. Akbar's favorite calligraphy style known as Nestalic, a fluid style with long horizontal strokes. It is written using the piece of trimmed reed with the tip of 5 to 10 mm called kalam dipped in carbon ink called siyahi. The dip of the kalam is usually split in the middle to facilitate the absorption of ink. Absorption of ink. The painted image. Painters too were involved in the production of Mughal manuscripts. Alongside the written text, images described an event in visual form. Paintings enhanced the beauty of a book. Painting enhanced the powers of communicating ideas about the kingdom. The historian Abu Fasal described the painting as a magical art. In his view, it had, a, it had the power to make inanimate objects look as if they possessed life. The production of paintings was sometimes opposed by the ulama due to the Islamic prohib prohibition of the portrayal of human by beings. Interpretations of the Sharia changed within the, with the time. The Safavid kings of Iran patronized finest artists who were trained in workshops set up at the court. The names of painters such as that of Bihzad contributed to spreading cultural fame of the Safavid court far and wide. Artists form artists from the Iran also reached in Mughal India. Iranian artists Mirsaid Ali and Abdus Samadat who accompanied, accompanied Emperor Humayun to Delhi. The Akbarnama and the Badshah Nama. 
ദ അക്ബർ നാമ അമങ് ദ ഇമ്പോർട്ടൻറ്റ് ഇല്ലസ്ട്രേറ്റഡ് മുഗൾ ക്രോണിക്കിൾസ് ഓഫ് ദ അക്ബർ നാമ ആൻഡ് ബാദിഷ നാമ ആർ ദ മോസ്റ്റ് വെൽ നാവ് ഇറ്റ് കണ്ടൈൻഡ് ആൻ ആവറേജ് ഓഫ് വൺ ഫിഫ്റ്റി ഫുൾ ഓർ ഡബിൾ പേജ് പെയിൻറ്റിങ്സ് ഓഫ് ബാറ്റിൽസ് സീജസ് ഹൺസ് ബിൽഡിംഗ് കൺസ്ട്രക്ഷൻ കോർട്ട് സീൻസ് എക്സെട്ര അബുൽ ഫസൽ The author of Abba Nama, Abul Fasal, grew up in the Mughal capital of Agra. He was widely read in Arabic, Persian, Greek philosophy and Sufism. Abul Fasal was a forceful debater and independent thinker who opposed ulama. Abul Fasal was appointed as advisor and spokesperson for his policies by Akbar. Abul Fasal worked on Akbar Nama for 13 years repeatedly revising the draft sources the Akbar Nama is based on range of sources including actual record of events official documents and oral testimonies of knowledgeable persons the Akbar Nama is divided into three books of which the first two are chronicles the first volume contains the history of mankind from adam to one celestial cycle of akbar's life 30 years the second volume closes his 46th reign year 1601 of akbar the third book is called aini akbari in 1602 abul fasal fell victim to a conspiracy hatched by prince selim and was murdered by his accomplice Bir Singh Bundala. The Akbar Nama was written to provide a detailed description of Akbar's reign and all aspects of Akbar's empire, geographic, social, administrative and cultural without reference to chronology. In the Aini Akbari, the Mughal Empire is presented as having a diverse population consisting of hindus jainas buddhist and muslims and a composite culture badshah nama story of shah jahan a people of abul fasal abdul hamid lahori is known as the author of the badshah nama emperor shah jahan commissioned him to write a history of his reign The Badshah Nama is this official history in three volumes or daftas of 10 lunar years each. Lahori wrote the first and second daftas comprising the first two decades of the emperor's rule. These volumes were later revised by Saadullah Khan, Shah Jahan's wazir. Infirmities of old age prevented Lahori from proceeding with the third decade which was then chronicled by the historian Wairis. Asiatic Society of Bengal founded by William Jones in 1784 undertook the editing, printing and translation of many Indian manuscripts. Edited versions of Akbar Nama and Badshah Nama were first published by Asiatic Society in the 19th century. Akbar Nama was translated into English by Henry Beveridge. Only excerpts from the Badshah Nama have been translated to English. The Nawab of Awadh gifted the illustrated Badshah Nama to King George III in 1790. Since then it has been preserved in the English royal collections now at Windsor Castle. In 1997 for the first time the Badshah Nama paintings were shown in exhibitions in New Delhi, London and Washington. The Ideal Kingdom a divine light. Court chroniclers drew upon many sources to show that the power of Mughal kings came directly from God. One of the legends they narrated was that of the Mongol queen Alankwa who was Mongol queen Alankwa who was impregnated by a ray of sunshine while resting in her tent. 
the offspring she bore carried this divine light and passed it from generation to generation abul fasl placed mughal kingship as the highest station in the hierarchy of objects receiving light emanating from god historical origin of divine light in plato's republic god is represented by the symbol of the sun a famous famous iranian sufi shihabuddin suhrawati who first developed the idea that there was a hierarchy which the divine light was transmitted to the king who then became the source of spiritual guidance for his subjects suhrawati's writings were studied by sheikh mubarak who transmitted their ideas to his sons faizi and abul fasl mughal artist from 17th century onwards began to portray emperors wearing a halo which they saw the european paintings of christ and virgin mary to symbolize the light of god a unifying force sulh e kul or absolute peace abul fasl describes the ideal of sulh e kul or absolute peace as the cornerstone of enlightened rule in sulh e kul all religions and schools of thought had freedom of expression the ideal of sulh e kul was implemented through state policies the nobility under the mughals was a composite one comprising iranis turanis afghanis rajputs rekanis all of whom were given position and awards purely on the basis of their service and loyalty to the king akbar abolished the tax of tax on pilgrimage in 1563 and jizya in 1564 as the two were based on religious discrimination instructions were sent to officers of the empire to follow the percept of sulhikul in the administration all mughal emperors gave grants to support the building and maintenance of places of worship even when temples were destroyed during war grants were later issued for their repair during the reigns of shah jahan and aurangzeb however during the reign of aurangzeb the jizya was reimposed on non muslim subjects just sovereignty as social contract abul fasl defined sovereignty as a social contract the emperor protects the four essence of his subjects namely life property honor and faith and in return demands obedience and share of resources one of the f- favorite symbols used the used by artists was the motif of a lion and the lamb or goat peace next to each other this was meant to signify a realm where both the strong and weak could exist in harmony capitals and courts capital cities the heart of the mughal empire was its capital city where the court assembled babur took over the lodi capital of agra though during the four years of his reign the court was frequently on the move during the 1560s akbar had the fort of agra constructed with red sandstone sandstone carried from the adjoining regions In the 1570s Akbar decided to build a new capital Fatehpur Sikri one of the reasons prompting him this this may have been that Sikri was located the direct road to Ajmer where the dargah of Sheikh Muinuddin Chisti had become an important pilgrimage center the Mughal emperors entered into a close relationship with Sufis of the Chisti silsila Akbar commissioned the construction 
of a white marble tomb for Sheikh Selim Chisti next to the majestic Friday Mosque at Sikri. The enormous arched gateway, Buland Darwaza, was meant to remind visitors of the Mughal victory in Agra, Mughal victory in Gujarat. In 1585, the capital was transferred to Lahore to bring the Northwest under greater control and Akbar closely watched at the frontier for 13 years. Shah Jahan pursued sound, Shah Jahan pursued sound fiscal policies and accumulated enough money to indulge his passion for buildings. In 1648, the court, army and household moved from Agra to the newly completed imperial capital Shah Jahanabad by Shah Jahan. Shah Jahanabad was a new addition to the old residential city of Delhi. Shah Jahanabad included the Red Fort, the Jama Masjid, a tree-lined esplanade with bazaars, Chandini Chowk, and spacious homes for the nobility. The Mughal Court Throne The physical arrangement of the court, focused on sovereign mirrored his status as the heart of the society. Its centerpiece was therefore the throne, the takht which gave physical form to the function of sovereign as axis mundi. The canopy, a symbol of kingship in India for a millennium, was believed to separate the radiance of the sun from that of the sovereign. Shah Jahan jeweled throne in the hall of public audience in the Agra Palace is described in Badshah Nama. In court, status was determined by spatial proximity to the king. Once the emperor sat on the throne, no one was permitted to move from his position or to leave without permission. The slightest infringement of etiquette was noticed and punished on the spot. Forms of salutation 1. Sijita, the highest form of submission. 2. Cornish, was a form of ceremonial salutation in which the courtier placed the palm of his right hand against his forehead and bent his head. 3. Chahar Taslim, it is a mode of salutation which begins with placing the back of the right hand on the ground and raising it gently till the person stands erect when he puts the palm of his hand upon the crown of his head. It is done four times. So it is known as Chahar Taslim. Taslim literally means submission. Zamin Bos is another form of salutation. It is kissing the ground. Five, Persian custom of clasping one's hands in front of the chest. The form of salutation to the ruler indicated the person's status in the hierarchy. Shah Jahan introduced Chahar Taslim and Zamin Bos. An ambassador presented to the Mughal emperor was expected to offer an acceptable form of greeting, either by bowing deeply or kissing the ground or else to follow the Persian custom of clasping one's hands in, in front of his chest. Thomas Rowe, the English envoy of James I, simply bowed before Jahangir according to European custom and further shocked the court by demanding a chair. Daily activities in the court Jaroka Darshan The emperor began his day at sunrise with personal religious devotions or prayers and then appeared on a small balcony, the Jaroka facing the east. Below, a crowd of people, soldiers, merchants, craftspersons, peasants, women with sick children waited for a view, darshan of the emperor. Jeroka darshan was introduced by Akbar. Abul Fasal gives a vivid account of Akbar's darbar, the darbar e Akbari. Divan e Am. After spending an hour at the Jeroka, the emperor walked to the public hall of audience, it is called a Divani Arm, to conduct the primary business of his government. State officials presented reports and made requests. 
Divani Khas. Two hours later, the emperor was in the Divani Khas to hold private audiences and discuss confidential matters. High ministers of state placed their petitions before him and tax officials presented their accounts. Occasionally, the emperor viewed the works of highly reputed artists or building plans of art architects. Festivals in the court The Mughal kings celebrated three major festivals a year. The solar and lunar birthdays of the monarch and Noros, the Iranian New Year, on the vernal equinox. On the birthdays, on his birthdays, the monarch was weighed against various commodities which were then distributed in charity. On special occasions such as the anniversary of accession to the throne, Eid, Shabi Barat and Holi, the court was full of life. Perfumed candles set in the rich holders and palaces was palaces palace walls festooned with colorful hangings made a tremendous impression on visitor. Shab e Barat is a full moon night on the fourteenth Shaban, the eighth month of the Hijri calendar, and is celebrated with prayers and fireworks in the titles and gifts. The title Asaf Khan for one of the highest ministers originated with Asaf, the legendary minister of the prophet King Sulaiman or Solomon. The title Mirza Raja was accorded by Aurangzeb to his two highest ranking nobles, Jai Singh and Jaswan Singh. Titles could be earned or paid for. Mir Khan offered rupees 1 lakh to Aurangzeb for the letter Alif that is A to be added to his name to make it Amir Khan. Other awards included the robe of honor or Kilat, a garment once worn by the emperor. One gift, the sarapa or head to foot, consisted of tunic, a turban and a sash or patka. Jeweled ornaments were often given as gift by the emperor. The lotus blossom set with jewels or Padma Murasa was given only in exceptional circumstances. A courtier never approached the emperor empty-handed. He offered either the small sum of money or large amount. Thomas Rowe was disappointed when a ring he had presented to Asaf Khan was returned to him for the reason that it was worth merely 400 rupees. The Imperial Household Harem The term harem is frequently used to refer to the domestic world of the Mughals. It originates, originates in the Persian world, Persian word haram meaning sacred place. The Mughal harem consisted of the emperor's wives and cookmen's his near and distant relatives, mother, step and foster mothers, sisters, daughters, daughter-in-law, aunts, children and female servants and slaves. Marriage Polygamy was practiced widely in the Indian subcontinent, especially among the ruling groups. Both for the Rajput clans as well as the Mughals, marriage was the way for cementing political relationship and forging alliances. The gift of territory was often accompanied by the gift of do doctor in marriage. Begums and Agras A distinction was maintained between wives who came from royal families Begums, and other wives Agas, who were not of noble birth. The Begums married after receiving a huge amount of cash and valuables as Dover Mahar naturally received a higher status and greater attention from their husband. The concubines, Agacha or Lesser Aga, occupied the lowest position in the hierarchy of females intimately related to royalty. They all received monthly allowances in cash supplemented with gift according to their status. Slaves 
Apart from wives, numerous male and female slaves populated the Mughal household. The tasks they performed varied from the most mundane to those requiring skill, tact and intelligence. Slave moved between the external and internal life of the household as guards, servants and also agents for women dabbling in commerce. After Noh Jahan, Mughal queens and princesses began to control significant financial resources. Jahanara and Roshanara, Shah Jahan's daughters. Shah Jahan's daughters, Jahanara and Roshanara, enjoyed an annual income often equal to that of high imperial mansabdars. Jahanara received revenues from the port, of, port city of Surat. Jahanara participated in many architectural projects of Shah Jahan's new capital, Shah Jahanabad. It, is, it was in Delhi. Among these was an imposing double-storied caravan serai with a courtyard and garden. The bazaars of Chandini Chowk, the throbbing center of Shah Jahanabad, was designed by Jahanara. Gulbadan became the daughter of Babur, an interesting book giving us a glimpse into the domestic world of Mughals is the Humayun Nama written by Gulbadan Begum. Gulbadan was the daughter of Babur, Humayun's sister and Akbar's aunt. Gulbadan could write fluently in Turkish and Persian. The Imperial Officials, Recruitment and Rank, Nobility One important pillar of Mughal state was its corps of officers also referred to by historians collectively as the nobility. The nobility was recruited from diverse ethnic and religious groups. This ensured that no faction was large enough to challenge the authority of the state. The officer crops of the Mughals was described as a bouquet of flowers held together by loyalty to the emperor. Nobles during Mughal period, Turani, Irani, Rajput and Indian Muslims. In Akbar, Akbar's imperial service, Turani and Iranian nobles were present from the earliest phase. Two ruling groups of Indian origin entered in the imperial service from 1560 onwards, the Rajputs and Indian Muslims. The first to join was Rajput chief Raja Barmal Kachwaha of Ampar, to whose doctor Akbar got married. Members of Hindu castes inclined towards education and accountancy were also promoted, a famous example being Akbar's finance minister Raja Todarmal, who belonged to the Khatri caste. Iranians gained high offices under Jahangir, whose politically influential queen Nur Jahan was an Iranian. Aurangzeb appointed Rajaputs to high positions and under him the Marathas accounted, account for the sizable number with the body of officers within the body of officers. Chandraban Barahman described the Mughal nobility in his book Char Chaman or Four Gardens, written during the reign of Shah Jahan, wrote people from many races, Arabs, Iranian, Turks, Tajiks, Kurds, Tatars, Russians, Abyssinians and so on, and from many countries, Turkey, Egypt, Syria, Iraq, Arabia, Iran, Kuras and Turan, included in the Mughal nobility. The Mansab Diary System Akbar designed the mansab system. All government officers held ranks or mansabs comprising two numerical designations. They were called mansabdas. Zat, which was an indicator of position in the imperial hierarchy and the salary of the official mansabdar. Savar, which indicated the number of horsemen in service. In the 17th century, mansabdars of thousand zat or above ranked as nobles, umara, which is plural of amir. The nobles participated in military campaigns, 
with their fam their armies and also served as officers of their empire in the provinces officers of the empire in the provinces the troopers maintained superior horses branded on the flank by imperial mark or dag akbar established spiritual relationship with a select band of his nobility by treating them as his disciples or murids a person wishing to join the service petitioned through a noble who presented a tajwiz to the emperor the mir bakshi or paymaster general stood in open court on the right of the emperor and presented all candidates for appointment or promotion while his office prepared orders bearing his seal and signature as well as those of the emperor there were two other important ministers at the center the divani ala finance minister and sadar sadar finish minister of grants or madad e marsh and in charge of appointing local local judges or qazis the three ministers occasionally came together as an advisory body nobles stationed at the court were a reserve force to be de- deputed to a province or military campaign information and empire the mir bakshi supervised the corps of court riders who recorded all applications and documents presented to the court and all imperial orders called farman agents or wakil of nobles and regional rulers recorded the entire proceedings of the court under the heading news from the exalted court or akbarat e darbar e muala which the date with the date and time of the court session the akbarat contained all kinds of information such as attendance at the court grant of officers and titles and diplomatic matters round the clock di- relays of foot runners carried papers rolled up in bamboo containers the emperor received reports from even distant provincial capitals within a few days the emperor was connected by su- surprisingly rapid information loop for public news provincial administration province called suba head of the province governor or subedar province is again divided into districts or sarkar head of sarkar faujdar sarkar is again divided into sub district or fargana head of farganas kanugo chaudhari khasi the central ministers had their corresponding subordinates divan bakshi and sadar in subas the head of provincial administration was the governor or subadar each suba was divided into sarkars controlled by faujdars or commandants who were deployed with the contingents of heavy cavalry and musketeers the local administration was looked after at the level of pargana sub district by three semi hereditary officers the kwanugo keeper of revenue records the chaudhari the charge of revenue collection and kasi throughout but local but local languages were used for village accounts local languages were used for village accounts the relationship between local landed magnates the zamindars and representatives of mughal emperor was sometimes marked by conflicts over authority and share of the resources the zamindars often succeeded in mobilizing peasant support against the state beyond the frontiers the safavids and kandahar the siege of kandahar the mughal emperors used side titles such as shahanshah king of kings jahangir world zaisar or shah jahan king of the world kandahar was a bone of contention between the safavids and mughals the fortress town kandahar had initially been in the possession of humayun reconquered in 1595 by akbar safavid court continued to stake claims to kandahar 
1613, Jahangir sent a diplomatic envoy to the court of Shah Abbas to appeal to plead the Mughal case for retaining Kandahar, but the mission failed. In the winter of 1622, a Persian army besieged Kandahar. The ill-prepared Mughal garrison was defeated and had to surrender the fortress and city to the Safavids. The Ottomans, Pilgrims and Trade The important pilgrim centers of Mecca and Medina were located in Hijaz, part of Hod Ottoman Arabia. The relationship between Mughals and the Ottomans was marked by the concern to ensure free movement of merchants and pilgrims in the territories under Ottoman control. Mughals combined religion and commerce by exporting valuable merchandise to Aden and Mocha, both Red Sea ports, and distributing the proceeds of the sales in the charity to the keepers of shrines and religious men there. However, when Aurangzeb discovered cases of misappropriation of funds sent to Arabia, he favored their distribution in India, which he thought was as much as house, as much a house of God as Mecca. Jesuits at the Mughal court. The first Jesuit mission reached the Mughal court at Fatehpur Sikri in 1580 years, stayed for about two years. The Jesuits spoke to Akbar about Christianity and debated its virtues with the ulama. Two more missions were sent to the Mughal court at Lahore in 1591 and 1595. The Jesuit accounts are based on personal observation and shed light, light on the character and mind of the emperor. At public assemblies, the Jesuits were assigned places in close proximity to Akbar's throne. They accompanied him on his campaigns, tutored his children, and were often companions of his leisure hours. Padre Rudolf Aquaviva was the leader of First Jesuit Mission. Montserrat, who was a member of the First Jesuit Mission, says that Akbar was very accessible to all. Montserrat remarked that the king cared little that in allowing everyone to follow his religion, he was in reality violating all. Akbar questioning former religion, religious life of Akbar. Interfaith debates in the Ibadat Khana. Akbar's quest for religious knowledge led to interfaith debates in the Ibadat Khana at Fatehpur Sikri between learned Muslims, Hindus, Jainas, Parsis and Christians. Akbar moved away from the orthodox Islamic ways of understanding religious towards a self-conceived eclectic form of divine worship focused on light, focused on light and the sun. Akbar and Abul Fasal created the philosophy of light and used it to shape the image of the king of ideology of the state. Akbar promulgated Deen e Ilahi, a new religion. Home in Harem. This is an excerpt from Abdul Qadir Badawini's Muntakabat ut Tawarik, a theologian and a courtier. From early youth, in compliment to his wives, the daughters of Rajas of Hind, His Majesty Akbar, had been performing home in the Harem, which is a ceremony derived from fire worship. On the new year of the 25th renal year, 1578, Akbar prostrated publicly before the sun and the fire. In the evening, the whole court had to rise up respectfully when the lamps and candles were lighted. Timeline, some major Mughal chronicles and memoirs.